My name is Associate Professor Meredith Nash, and I am a Senior Advisor for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity at the Australian Antarctic Division. My story begins in 2016. I'm on a ship to Antarctica as a sociologist to study a group of 77 women who are about to embark on a three-week leadership program for women in STEM. Now, these women worked in all different scientific fields. There were mathematicians, evolutionary biologists, geologists, pharmacologists, forest rangers, astronomers, and engineers. Up until this point as a sociologist, I had basically never thought about Antarctica, women in STEM, or just how seasick you can get from a four meter swell. But this voyage was important because it was the largest non-scientific expedition of women to Antarctica in history. You see, women have been heading south to Antarctica in a range of capacities for decades. But the thing is, the icy continent has historically been a place for men to do research and exploration. So during my three weeks in Antarctica, I pondered this question. How had our expedition come to be such a big deal? How had Antarctica come to be so dominated by men? Where were all the women? And the answer to my question had been there all along, on a map on the wall of the ship where I looked every morning to see where we were headed. Now on one of these mornings, I spotted Marguerite Bay on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. Aha, I thought. So there were women here, at least symbolically, ages ago. Antarctica has been mapped geographically since ancient times, but its human history is relatively new. And for the most part, when we talk about Antarctica's human history, we're talking about heroic white men who explored the continent. But who was Marguerite? Her name reached the Antarctic because her husband, Dr. Jean-Baptiste Charcot, who was leader of the French Antarctic expedition, discovered a bay and named it for her in 1909. So there she was, symbolically, as were many of the other women in Antarctica. They were names on maps. In fact, more than 200 places in Antarctica are named after women. In 1931, two Norwegians, Ingrid Christensen and Matilda Weger, were the first women to visit Antarctica, and they actually stayed on the ship. A coast was even named in Ingrid Christensen's honor. Australian explorer Douglas Mawson also landed in Antarctica in 1931, and he got quite a shock when he saw Christensen and Vega on a ship, and he reported his astonishment to the Sydney Morning Herald. Now, it's entirely possible that women visited Antarctica early, but their stories were never recorded. We do know that when Ernest Shackleton advertised his 1914 Antarctic expedition, three sporty girls begged to join him. But he replied, quote, regrets there are no vacancies for the opposite sex on the expedition. So Caroline Mickelson was the first woman to set foot on Antarctica in 1935. She arrived a century after men. Nell Law was the first Australian woman to set foot on the continent at Mawson in 1960. Nell accompanied her husband, Phil Law, on the Maga Dan. Now, Phil was the director of the Australian Antarctic Division, and he was also leader of the Australian National Antarctic Research Expeditions, or NARI. Nell was an artist, and some of her paintings from this voyage can actually be seen right here at the Australian Antarctic Division. But see, there's a really interesting story about this voyage. When Phil Law decided he wanted to take Nell to Antarctica, he actually had to smuggle her onto the ship in Perth. When Nell was discovered by the crew, it caused quite a stir, and she could only stay because they thought it would cause too much negative publicity for the voyage. But in the end, it was a great boon for Inari, and it led to increased support for the wives of expeditioners. In fact, the Danish-built icebreaker, MV Nella Dan, was later named in Nell's honor. Then in 1969, an American group of all women scientists, led by Lois Jones, landed in Antarctica. The significance of this expedition was noted by Walter Sullivan in the, in the New York Times when he described this expedition of US scientists as, quote, an incursion of females into the largest male sanctuary remaining on this planet. Following these developments, the Australian Antarctic Division and the British Antarctic Survey started to allow women to stay on research stations and to conduct land-based Antarctic fieldwork, beginning in the 1980s. Now today, of course, women are much more fully integrated into national Antarctic programs, and women often lead field teams. Nearly 60% of early career researchers in polar science internationally are women. But there's still work to be done, which is why I'm here at the Australian Antarctic Program as a senior advisor for inclusion, diversity, and equity. 
For example, while women's participation in the Australian Antarctic program is increasing, women still comprise only 24% of expeditioners. The US Antarctic program and the British Antarctic program report 33% and 30% respectively. Antarctica is a diverse workplace, and as such, we need to continually reassess our processes and procedures to ensure that a polar career is safe and accessible for all people. Considering changing social norms and recent movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, the Australian Antarctic Division has acknowledged that there is a need to rethink equity and inclusion in the context of polar research and to address the structural inequality that underpins science more broadly. So a key question for us moving forward is whether we're going to interrupt or disrupt gender inequality in the Australian Antarctic program. So interrupting is recognizing that inequality exists, but maybe we aren't holding ourselves accountable. Disrupting inequality is about ending inequality. We're saying that we commit to holding systems and people accountable. But disruption requires a mindset of vulnerability. It's this recognition of the fact that change is hard, it is long, and there are no shortcuts. And we might make mistakes along the way, but that's okay. So my aim is to use insights from social science to spark a conversation about what disrupting inequality looks like in the Australian Antarctic program and how we can bring about systematic change within Antarctic research. So for example, this year I'm focusing on how we can update the image of an Antarctic scientist so that it is more inclusive of underrepresented groups like women, people of color, and LGBTIQ folks. I'm also working to ensure that here at the Australian Antarctic Division, we are regularly engaging our community in issues of diversity and equity, like celebrating International Days of Recognition, like NADOC Week, and recognizing polar pride. This is important because it will enrich the diversity of the scientific community, and it will have flow-on effects for the quality of Australia's Antarctic science. <laughs>